Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. My name is Gord Steven. I'm a senior researcher at NREL uh, in the Grid Planning and Analysis Center. Um, and I'm also the lead developer of PRAS, our probabilistic resource adequacy suite. So I'm uh, excited to be here today to share with you all a bit about what PRAS is and what it does and how it's been used uh, here at the lab in the past uh, and how you might be uh, interested in using it yourself in the future. Um, before we dive in too much to the specifics of the tool itself, I thought it might be useful to set the stage a bit with what actually resource adequacy is, why we would want to study it with a tool like Praz, um, and just provide some context for you know what we're doing when we're a set, doing a resource adequacy analysis using a tool like Praz. Um, so this is a figure from uh, a report uh, out of ESIG from a few years ago that I think does a good job of situating resource adequacy in the broader context of power system reliability. Um, so while power system reliability encompasses lots of, of different aspects of keeping the lights on, resource adequacy is really focused on one kind of subset of those factors. Um, and in particular, it's focused with the kind of bulk level supply demand balance questions around the grid. Do we have enough stuff in the right places built in terms of infrastructure investments uh, to provide the energy and the power that we need um, to, to keep the lights on. Um, so that looks at things like the availability of different generators as a function of time. Um, you can imagine with things like wind and solar, uh, that becomes increasingly important. Um, but also things that we've focused on more historically, like uh, stochastic or random outages of thermal generating units as well, as well as uh, other uncertainties associated with, with load and those types of things. Um, so uh, unlike something like resilience, where we're thinking more about the ability to recover from really extreme events or things like uh, frequency or voltage stability, resource adequacy is kind of the corner of, re of reliability that, that focuses on these big picture supply demand balance questions. And as such is sort of the kind of the first screening pass that you take uh, when you're trying to study a power system and trying to understand whether or not it would be reliable in the future. Um, so resource adequacy has gotten more complicated over the years to assess. Uh, and I would contend that there's sort of four primary drivers of complexity in resource adequacy in modern power system assessment. Um, the first of which is not necessarily new. It's kind of always been there, uh, even back when we were focused predominantly on planning systems with purely thermal, uniformly available resources. Um, and that's uncertainty, the fact that as we're planning the grid today, we don't actually know what's going to be happening in a specific time period at some point in the future. Um, so uh, transmission uh, lines and generators, all these things ex can experience unplanned outages. Things come offline when we weren't expecting them to. And sometimes those outages happen in really unopportune times relative to the needs of the system. So we want to be able to study um, in probabilistic terms because we can't uh, quantify this exactly and accurately with perfect knowledge of the future, what the probabilistic risk is of not being able to balance supply and demand and get energy to when and where we need it on the power system uh, be due to unforeseen probabilistic or uncertain events uh, like generator outages and transmission outages. Um, and that is not new, right? So uh, coal plants, nuclear plants, you know, any kind of uh, resource that we have traditionally thought of as being uniformly available uh, and not subject to uh, variability like uh, wind and solar, for example, uh, has these same considerations. And we've had to consider them for a long time. Um, but the, uh, the requirement to consider these kind of probabilistic factors has just gotten more and more complicated as we've integrated new types of resources into the system and as we expect to integrate more of those types of resources into the system. Um, and the integration of those new technologies is really what drives the other three uh, pillars, I would, I would call, of complexity in modern resource adequacy assessment. So the, the second and perhaps the most obvious when we're talking about integration of renewable energy is variability. Uh, so obviously, different types of resources don't, aren't all available at the same time or uh, in the same manner across time. Um, and capturing this variability, this time dependence of when particular resources are able to be generating or not generating uh, is obviously critical when we're trying to assess the resource adequacy of a power system with large uh, shares of wind and solar resources on it, for example. 
as we integrate more and more wind and solar resources, we also start uh, needing to basically have power systems that have more di geographic diversity than weather patterns do. And so that introduces uh, the third factor of complexity in resource adequacy assessment, which is spatial coupling. Basically the idea that at any given point in time, it's not enough to know what's going on right in my local neighborhood as far as being able to understand the potential reliability or resource adequacy implications uh, of the context I'm operating in. But I need to take a wider view and look at what's going on across the broader system, what's happening with my neighbors, and understand based on that whether or not I can lean on them or they're needing to lean on me um, as we integrate more and more renewables and are trying to uh, get more geographic and weather diversity um, to make that those integrations uh, more cost effective and economic. Um, so understanding this, the kind of wide area impacts and the, the coupling that um, more and more transmission interconnection brings becomes something that, that becomes much more critical. We can't uh, assess the system's resource adequacy in a, in a vacuum. We really need to be thinking about the bigger picture of the full system, especially um, with systems like we have here in the United States that are um, uh, across very large geographic extents. And then finally, we also have temporal coupling. So this is introduced by new technologies like storage or demand response, things that are energy limited resources where there are intertemporal consequences to using them or not using them at a particular point in time. So if I have a storage resource and I choose to charge it right now or discharge it right now, that's gonna have implications on whether or not I'm able to balance supply and demand of electrical energy at some point in the future because I'll have either more or less energy available from that storage device uh, in the future based on my actions today. So when we study resource adequacy, it's important that we're capturing these kind of chronological uh, cascading effects and dependencies uh, that get introduced by these types of resources as well. So for modern resource adequacy assessment, it's really important that we have a tool available to us that can capture not just uncertainty, which has kind of been the classical um, approach or the classical focus of resource adequacy assessment and probabilistic assessment, but that we're also capturing variability, spatial coupling, and temporal coupling as well. So that's kind of the high level kind of big picture view of the types of things we want to capture in a resource adequacy assessment. But we can also make it a bit more concrete and tangible um, to uh, in case anyone is not familiar with this concept of resource adequacy assessment, and what we're actually doing when we perform one of these analyses. So if we think about a system uh, that has some amount of time varying demand, uh, what we want to do is understand how our system is equipped to balance this demand against supply and what the risk of not being able to maintain that balance uh, might be due to bulk power uh, or energy shortfalls. So if we have this time series, so you see demand moving up and down on the y-axis and then moving on the x-axis across time, uh, we want to compare this time series of demand uh, requirement to our time series of supply availability. And in some of these time periods, we're going to have, hopefully most of the time periods, we're going to have some surplus, some generation margin available that is where we have more supply than we need to actually uh, provide the demand that's required of the system. And so this is a good thing. Uh, we want that margin um, in order to be able to accommodate uh, different unforeseen contingencies and things like that. Uh, but we don't always have that this kind of margin, right? There are going to be periods, hopefully very rare, hopefully a lot more rare than this kind of cartoon picture depicts, uh, where we have a shortfall, where we don't have enough supply to meet demand and kind of the, the net balance is negative. And in these conditions, uh, there's going to have to be some kind of involuntary uh, load shedding or disconnection of demand from the system in order to uh, prevent the entire grid from uh, destabilizing and collapsing. And so uh, the question when we do a, a resource adequacy analysis is what's the actual uh, profile of that shortfall risk? So when is that shortfall risk happening? And when we do see these types of shortfall events, how long do they last? How deep are they? What's the overall energy unserved associated with these events? And then based on this uh, approach, we want to basically consolidate all of these uh, time series of shortfalls across uh, different realizations, because remember, we want to capture things like uncertainty as well. We don't have one single realization of what supply might might look like in the future. 
Uh, and based on all these alternate ways of playing out this supply demand balance simulation, we want to aggregate all these uh, all these outcomes together into some sort of aggregate statistical measure of the reliability of the system overall. So on average, how much uh, unserved energy is there? On average, how many hours or days uh, across your analysis horizon are you seeing unserved energy occurring in? Um, and you can also get into more kind of tail risk metrics like percentiles or continuous value at risk as well, if you'd like. So when we perform a resource adequacy analysis, what we're really doing is playing out all these different simulations, collecting all this information about the way that that potential bad events could unfold, and as well as understanding the relative probabilistic likelihood of being in those bad cases relative to more optimistic or normal looking cases, and then combining those all together into these probabilistic risk metrics uh, that you, many of you have probably heard about things like loss of load expectation, expected unserved energy, loss of load probability. So doing this type of analysis uh, across long stretches of time and large uh, time series data sets because we want to capture lots of different types of weather while also capturing uh, factors like transmission independent interdependencies and storage chronological dispatch and, and cascading those effects through time uh, is and all these different probabilistic scenarios that we want to study you know here we're kind of looking at four but in reality we might be looking at hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of these types of alternate scenarios uh, that requires a particular uh, software tool to be able to do that. This gets a lot more complicated than something you just want to do in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. Um, so at NREL, the tool we developed to do this type of assessment is PRAS, our probabilistic resource adequacy suite. And so PRAS is really focused on um, being able to answer these types of really core fundamental supply demand balance questions and stripping away any other aspects of uh, power system operational representation that might uh, slow down the ability to get those answers. And by doing that, we're able to really efficiently study really large systems across really large uh, time series data sets and understand all these spatial and temporal couplings that uh, are um, not necessarily easy to uh, calculate, uh, especially for these, these large systems. So with PRAS, we're able to very quickly, in uh, when we perform our simulations, capture uh, things like resource and load diversity. So for in particular, if we're studying very uh, large power systems that span multiple different climate regions, multiple different time zones, we want to be able to understand how the, that requirement of when and where demand is uh, balancing relative to supply uh, may have benefits or challenges associated with these different types of diversity. We want to be able to understand how different regions can or can't depend on their neighbors and how that has implications for what levels of capacity investment are required in different regions. We want to be capturing every single hour of a chronological dispatch so we know that we're not missing anything as far as storage's inability to charge, for example, during a certain time period, which would then cascade forward and cause problems later in the analysis. And and we also want to be able to capture things like weather dependent outages. So um, I think there's increasingly uh, awareness and acknowledgement in the industry that even resources like uh, thermal generation uh, have weather dependencies. Obviously, things like wind and solar do, load do. Um, but when it gets really cold or it gets really hot, uh, things like natural gas plants can have a higher likelihood of not being available as well. And we want to be able to capture those types of dynamics uh, directly in our tool too. Um, so Praz was designed to be able to do all of these different things. It's free and open source software, so it's available right now on GitHub. You can go look at all the code, understand how it works, run it for yourself, make any changes. You basically can do whatever you want with it. Um, and it's designed to run not only uh, in a uh, relatively small computational footprint, like on a laptop, but it also scales up. Uh, to be able to run on high performance computing facilities like we have here at NREL. Uh, and using those types of capabilities, we're also able to perform lots of um, really interesting sensitivity analyses and looking look across really large, large, large uh, sets of scenarios that we might want to consider for a given power system that we're studying. So I, I find it useful to think about PRAS as kind of uh, broken up into three parts. 
The first part is the actual input power system representation that you provide to the tool. So this is where you're defining all the different parameters of your power system. Uh, you're defining different regions with tr uh, transmission and transfer capabilities between those regions. You're assigning generation and load to each of those regions. Uh, you're providing reliability statistics so that the model can generate probabilistic draws of unforeseen or unplanned uh, generator and transmission line outages. Um, and once you have that overall representation of your power system, you pass it into the next stage of the model, which is the, the core kind of engine of PRAS, which are the probabilistic simulations themselves. Um, and so these are what do all those uh, random draws of different conditions and then play out those different conditions and see how power system operation, uh, what it would look like under those different situations and what the outcomes that we care about would be. And then the third part is actually aggregating those outcomes together, combining them in whatever way makes sense for the particular problem or question you're asking, uh, and reporting out your traditional resource adequacy metrics like EUE, LOLE, LOLP, as well as additional outputs that um, are available from the model that you may be interested in. So if we zoom in for a minute on the power system representation piece, what actually is going on there as far as the inputs to the model? Um, sometimes I get asked, you know, can PRAS represent this technology or that technology? Uh, so what PRAS actually does internally is it basically has four key uh, components that it considers. And, and pretty much any technology that you would want to uh, study can be mapped into one of these different compo components. Um, so the, the first and kind of most simplest up here on the top left is uh, generation uh, generator type. Uh, uh, objects or, or generator uh, resources. And these are exactly what they sound like. They're just some resource that's able to inject uh, electrical energy into the system that, that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, and so, and uh, that injection capability, uh, like every parameter in PRAS can be defined as a time series. Um, so that allows us to capture both uh, resources with more uniform availability. So things like thermal generation, as well as variable renewable resources like wind and solar. Um, and in practice, probably the vast majority of the generators that you represent in your uh, PRAS model are going to be just normal vanilla generators. Um, we also have lines, which are the kind of fundamental unit of power transfer between multiple regions in the system. Um, and these uh, can have both forward and backward transfer capacities associated with them. So if you want to model things like um, voltage constraints or, or other types of factors that aren't just your symmetrical thermal transfer limits, you're able to capture that as well. Uh, then we have storage devices, which unlike lines, which move power across space, storage devices move power across time. Um, so uh, they have charge and discharge capacities and energy ratings, um, uh, which basically measure the amount, the rate at which you can move power into the energy reservoir and then how much energy you can store in that reservoir. And so uh, we commonly will model things like uh, batteries or, or uh, hydrogen storage as these types of storage devices. Uh, and then the fourth uh, category of resource that Praz is able to represent is a little bit more abstract, but I think it's also the most powerful in that it basically combines all the characteristics of a generator and a storage device into one device that we call a generator storage. Um, and so this is useful for modeling uh, different types of resources that um, that the grid sees as a single basically uh, injection point, but that behind the scenes has both shared characteristics of providing new net energy to the system, as well as shifting energy across time. Um, so examples of this might be things like DC coupled uh, PV battery uh, hybrid facilities or uh, reservoir storage that has um, potentially pump storage capability, but is also taking in water from upstream and then has the uh, flexibility of when to just that batch that downstream, whether to do that right away or to store that for later. Um, so there's, there's, those are kind of the most common applications of generator storage uh, devices or resources that we uh, see in PRAS, but they're also kind of um, uh, less common or more novel uh, use cases for it as well. This model works really well for representing, for example, heat reservoirs with concentrating solar power, um, or even things like uh, fuel stockpiling for thermal plants. So say you've got a coal plant and there's a train load of coal that comes in on a certain frequency, you wanna model that delivery relative to the actual use of that fuel. And you wanna understand if that train was a 
was to be disrupted for some reason, how long would you be able to continue operating uh, the system and what would the implications for overall system grid system reliability be uh, given those types of uh, constraints uh, if you wanted to model those, those types of things as well. So those are the kind of the four building blocks of a Pratt system. Once you have a, a model defined that um, parameterizes all of those different types of resources and maps your system into them, you can then move on to actually simulating the operation of that system under these different types of probabilistic conditions. Uh, so what is going on kind of inside the box here is exactly what I talked about before. Basically, we're having, we have all these different alternate operating conditions that the system could probabilistically end up in. Some are more likely, some are less likely. We want to sample these different probabilistic conditions in some kind of statistically representative way. And then based on that sample, we want to play out what the operating system under that condition or that sequence of evolving conditions uh, would look like uh, by using a um, kind of stripped down, really fast, but minimal uh, power system operations representation. And then once we've done that for all these different samples, we're going to combine those together to uh, the outputs. If we zoom in a little further on the actual simulation piece, sometimes people ask me, you know, what, what is the actual, you know, uh, dispatch problem that's being solved under the hood inside press? And really fundamentally, it's a, it's a question of balancing network flows. So we have some available generation, which is able to inject power in the grid in every region. We have some load, which is taking off power from the grid in every region. We have transmission, which allows us to move power between all these different regions, subject to certain constraints on how much we can move where. And then we also have energy limited resources, so storage and generator storage objects, which are able to either inject or withdraw potentially, depending on whether you've you set up the individual resources to be able to do those different things, uh, power to the grid or take power off from the grid at a given point in time. Or they may choose not to do that and save that power for later or charge later because there isn't a lot of surplus available right now. Um, and fundamentally, we're just basically looking at this network, looking at all these different ways we can take power into and out of the network and trying to find a solution that minimizes the amount of load that doesn't get served. So we want to make sure that if we can, we're serving all that load. And if we're not, we're serving as much of it as possible. So in uh, assessing this, uh, this network problem, we're considering obviously things like uh, the availability of all the different generators, so both renewable uh, generators, which might have time varying availability, as well as thermal generators, which might have potentially time varying availability, um, but also potentially um, uh, probabilistic outages, failures, uh, mechanical outages, things like that. Uh, we're obviously uh, considering all the parameters associated with the storage and energy limited devices, so charge and discharge ratings, uh, energy reservoir sizes, those types of things the magnitude of load at any given point in time and place, um, and then the ability to move that power between those different regions. What we're explicitly not considering here is any kind of economics. So this is really a physical feasibility question as stylized by this kind of pipe and bubble transmission model. So we're also not looking at um, AC or DC OPF power flow, for example. Um, and by kind of setting those things aside, what we're able to do is really efficiently drill into the particular questions and outcomes that we need to study in a resource adequacy tool. And we're able to do that really quickly relative to something like a production cost model, um, which can obviously model all of these phenomena as well, um, but also models a lot of additional stuff on top of that and has a lot of uh, overhead associated with that um, that would uh, cause these types of simulations to often take much longer, sometimes multiple orders of magnitude longer uh, to run. So once we have this uh, simulation conducted, for every snapshot, every kind of step forward in time across all of these different scenarios that we want to consider, uh, we then move on to the last step, which is aggregating these different outcomes into the risk metrics that we care about. And there's a number of different outcomes that we can actually study in PRAS, not just the kind of classical shortfall one, which is by far the most commonly used output metric. Um, so that's what gets you things like your EUE or LOLE numbers, as well as you know more granular uh, sample level breakdowns of how much uh, unserved energy you had in a particular sample in a particular region at a particular point in time, if you want that. Um, but we also are able to report out other things like surplus. So how much energy or power was not 
called on in a given region at a point in time, which can help you understand things like near misses and times when when the system was tight, but maybe wasn't actually dropping energy uh, load or have unserved energy. We can also look at uh, things like uh, interface uh, flow and utilization. So the, the usage of the transmission infrastructure to move power between different regions, uh, either in, in absolute megawatt terms, which is what flow is, or in relative terms, which is what utilization is, um, which can also consider the fact that you may have a degraded utilization because one of the lines on your interregional interface was, was forced offline, for example. Um, and you had some thermal limit that was now um, binding your ability to transfer power between regions. Uh, we can also look at the state of charge status of storages and generator storages. So understanding when is the system kind of net charging or building up a surplus energy reservoir, and when is it drawing down on that energy um, on a device by device level across different regions and time periods. Uh, and finally, because all these different resources have reliability statistics associated with them and we're generating probabilistic uh, draws of forced outages, we can also go in and have uh, reporting on what specific units were forced offline or not at a given point in time and understand how particular reliability events may tie back to unavailability of particular generation or transmission resources. And I'll add that while this uh, kind of set of six output uh, properties covers the vast, vast majority of all the studies that we do here at NREL, uh, looking at lots of different aspects of power system resource adequacy. Uh, if you want to, uh, Praz also provides the ability to have basically user-defined custom extensions that are plugins that hook in inside the simulation engine, and as it's running, can extract other uh, characteristics or other outcomes from uh, the dispatch problems that are being solved if you know these six uh, uh, outcomes aren't sufficient for the particular question you are asking. And there's some other piece of information that's available internally that you'd like to get access to. We provide uh, kind of um, non-invasive ways for the user to define uh, little bits of code that can go in and extract that things and hook in as the, the simulation's running uh, to capture those, those events as well. So it's very customizable. Um, if there are things that aren't kind of built in that uh, you want to get access to as well. Okay, so uh, from there, I'll switch over a bit to talk about uh, some different use cases and, and cases where uh, Praz has been used for different studies here at the lab and in, par in uh, partnership with, with external partners as well um, that kind of showcases some of the different aspects of Praz that I think are, are somewhat interesting. Uh, so the first uh, example that I'll start with is a North American Renewable Integration Study. Um, so this was uh, a few years ago now. This was actually the impetus for building PRAS and developing the tool in the first place. So this study looked at um, trying to understand what a co-optimized uh, power system that considered not just the entire United States, but also uh, generation capacity expansion and dispatch in uh, Canada and in Mexico, what a um, kind of continental scale uh, collaborative power system design could look like and what the implications would be there for uh, potentially facilitating the integration of uh, renewable energy, things like that. So being able to not just leverage, you know, moving power across different time zones, but also across different climate regions, across, uh, you know, very different um, uh, operating context for the grid where uh, having all of this diversity might provide a lot of benefits. And so to understand the potential benefits of all that diversity, we wanted to be able to model the operations of the system and understand the probabilistic risks that the system would uh, be facing um, in one kind of coherent uh, co-optimized tool. Um, and uh, production cost models, you know, take days and weeks to run for this entire system at the level of detail that we typically run production cost models at. So we really knew we needed uh, a tool that was much more stripped down and optimized and focused on answering these types of resource adequacy questions. And that was the impetus for the development of PRAS. Um, in, the, in NERIS, with PRAS, we were studying 204 different regional bubbles, you know, in this pipe and bubble transmission model, um, and, and simulating that for, you know, our annual 8760 time series. Uh, and we were actually looking at 100,000 different uh, probabilistic realizations uh, of that time series under all the different scenarios we wanted to study. Um, and one sort of set of those samples for those 100,000 years of operations across three countries, you know, the entire continent of North America, 
um, ran on one of our uh, nodes on our, uh, at the time, uh, Peregrine supercomputer, which had, I think, 36 cores, which is honestly not super exotic by today's standards. Um, and that ran in three hours um, for, with 100,000 samples, right? So um, if you wanted to, to dial that back, I mean, you could easily get a 10x improvement in speed if you only did 10,000 samples, right? Uh, so the, the, I think the point I just want to make with this is that PRAS from the ground up really was designed for computational performance and the ability to study really large power systems and understand the dynamics associated with wide area resource adequacy, resource sharing. For a bit of a different uh, application, uh, we can also look at the Los Angeles 100% Renewable Energy Study. So this was obviously a much smaller geographic uh, scope. We were just focused on uh, the LADWP uh, footprint, um, you know, so basically a subset of the, of the entire Western interconnection. Um, and But within that small footprint, we wanted to do lots and lots of different sensitivity analysis. So here we were at, uh, this study basically looked at nine different, quite diverse scenarios for future constraints um, and conditions under which the Los Angeles power system would be operating. And we wanted to use PRAS to probabilistically explore all of these scenarios, not just uh, once, but across multiple different weather years, across multiple different assumptions about transmission availability, um, and also under multiple different sensitivities around the uh, addition or removal of firm capacity to understand kind of how close are we to the particular reliability targets that we uh, want to achieve in terms of this kind of I this idealized capacity, um, which was kind of easier for people to wrap their head around. Um, and so what you can see from these plots is the, the red dash lines are the um, reliability metrics or targets that we established. Uh, and basically each of these lines is a different weather year or different transmission line uh, reliability assumption. And what we see is that we can generally remove, you know, a gigawatt plus from any of these scenarios and of, of supply and still be meeting our resource adequacy targets. So that gave ourselves and the, uh, the LA Department of Water and Power um, good confidence that these scenarios that we were generating were actually going to be resource adequate. Another example um, of something that I think is quite topical that a lot of people are interested in these days is understanding uh, weather-driven outage, uh, so outages. So things like um, thermal generation that we've traditionally assumed will kind of just have the same failure rate regardless of what's going on in the system. Uh, those types of assumptions are increasingly being challenged and to some extent invalidated. Um, now. Uh, and so capturing the ability for uh, outage rates to change through time as a function of exogenous factors like temperature um, is something that's becoming increasingly topical. Um, so uh, my colleague here at NREL, Senator Murphy, um, well, he was still doing his PhD, uh, did some really cool groundbreaking work in this topic and continues doing that work now uh, using here at NREL using uh, the PRAS uh, tool as, as a way of capturing the kind of I would call best in class representation of this time evolving uh, outage rate uh, using heterogeneous Markov chains um, in order to uh, capture these impacts and understand if we, if we model these phenomena and if we see a particular extreme weather event, what might happen as far as uh, unreliability of different types of resources and what are the grid scale implications of those outages at the generator level. We can also use PRAS to understand uh, things like economic trade-offs uh, between reliability and uh, system cost and investment requirements. Um, so the National Transmission Planning Study is one example of this where uh, using the REEDS model, um, the an analyst team looked at a bunch of different levels of reliability that they could design a system to and then tested those different uh, planning reserve margin choices basically uh, in PRAS to understand the uh, probabilistic risk associated with those different outcomes and those different levels of um, infrastructure investment. And um, quite interestingly, I think, looked at how those trade-off curves between reliability and cost can shift around based on the availability or not of different types of resources. And the, the uh, primary focus here obviously was the availability of different transmission expansion uh, options. Uh, and basically saw that as you provide the ability to build more transmission as one of your investment choices, you're able to achieve uh, more reliable systems at lower cost relative to cases where you're not able to do that. 
We can also use Praz uh, in conjunction with other tools. Um, so I've already kind of highlighted uh, the things that I think Praz does really well, as well as the things that Praz by design doesn't focus on. But if you care about those other aspects of things like economics and prices and, and understanding uh, which particular units get dispatched uh, in order to meet uh, demand more cost effectively, you can couple Praz with a full-blown production cost model um, like our Sienna tool, which we've already had a webinar on, and I'd encourage folks to check that out uh, if they're interested to, to learn more. Um, Praz simulates grid operations at a very kind of stripped down, minimalist, very fast uh, scale. And then Sienna takes a much more detailed, full featured approach to capturing lots of much more sophisticated operating constraints and conditions um, that can be modeled, including things like nodal power flow. Um, and unit commitment and, and all these types of things. So what we've done um, in the past uh, is looked at combining uh, Praz and Sienna into a single analysis to understand as we layer in these additional constraints and additional kind of sophistication in our representation of the power system, how does that actually impact our the the easy the, the ease with which we can balance supply and demand? Um, and maintain resource adequacy? Or are there conditions or constraints that when we add them really uh, increase the perceived uh, risk to the system and decrease the system's resource adequacy? Um, so this uh, was some work done a few years ago um, by some of my colleagues, colleagues, Yinong Sun and uh, Bethany Fru, who led this work uh, that really uh, looked at some of these different um, uh, aspects of, of power system operating constraints. And interestingly found that as you add in more and more of these constraints, really the only ones that really have a step change in terms of the observed resource adequacy of the system was once you started getting into um, forecast errors and incomplete information in your day ahead uh, dispatch when you're uh, committing thermal units, for example, uh, with with imperfect information, and then things turn out differently than you might expect. Maybe one of those thermal units goes on outage. Uh, that causes um, uh, additional resource adequacy problems. So the the uh, really um, emphasizing the importance of good quality forecasting in maintaining operational uh, reliability that we maybe wouldn't normally see if we were just using Praz on its own. Uh, and then finally, another example of this kind of multi-tool uh, coordination is uh, between REEDS, which uh, is uh, NREL's uh, flagship national capacity expansion model, and PRAS, uh, our resource adequacy tool. Um, what uh, The way REEDS uh, historically has uh, assessed resource adequacy is using your kind of traditional planning reserve margin constraints and capacity accreditation techniques. Um, and then it gets out a system. And then what we would do is we kind of, after the fact, manually go and test that system and see whether Praz thought it was resource adequate or not. What we're doing now is actually much tighter coupling between reads and PRAS. So as part of a reads run, uh, the, the candidate system design will be automatically tested in PRAS, and then feedback will be provided back to reads about whether the system was resource adequate, or if it wasn't, in what time periods it was particularly challenged. What were the most stressful conditions that were being seen in PRAS that weren't necessarily being seen in reads, which only considers a limited set of representative days and not the full chronology that PRAS sees. And based on this feedback, we can actually uh, create systems that are more reliable and more cost effective to achieve that reliability than we would have been able to otherwise. Um, and so, uh, so uh, my colleague Jess Kuna led a paper on this kind of concept uh, earlier this year. And um, uh, some of the other folks uh, on the Reeds team, including True and Patrick Brown, have a paper coming out uh, hopefully later this year that really uh, digs into this these details a lot more uh, with, with some of the quantified benefits of this for uh, the PRAS or for um, the Reeds uh, model specifically and its integration with PRAS. Okay, so um, if any of that has kind of struck a nerve or seemed interesting, seemed like something you might be uh, interested in pursuing uh, in your own analyses, uh, you're more than welcome to use Praz for yourself. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's free and open source software. Anyone can go take it, use it, uh, look at what's inside and, and learn from that and, and use it in other places as well. Um, if you are interested in that, I think the best place to uh, start with that would be uh, our documentation website. So nrel.github.io slash Praz. There's links there to the full Praz uh, technical report manual, as well as some getting started and installation uh, guides that'll walk you through the process of getting Praz installed and running on your computer. Finally, uh, before we wrap up, I'll just mention a couple things that we're looking at uh, moving forward into the next year. Uh, so things kind of on the horizon, not here yet with Praz, but, but hopefully coming soon. 
I've already emphasized that Praz really doesn't do anything uh, to do with economics at all. Uh, we are interested in improving on that, seeing if there's kind of a middle ground we can strike between the sort of pure reliability dispatch that Praz does today and the full-blown optimization-based production cost modeling that a tool like Sienna would. Uh, and so uh, we are in the process of, of doing some things in that space that uh, I won't go into detail on here, but uh, the end result of that would ideally be something that can capture many of those economic dynamics without sacrificing much uh, in the way of computational runtime. It may actually be faster because of some tricks and things we've been able to find. Um, I'll also mention uh, another thing we're really interested in is understanding not just kind of the optimal best case scenario for what a um, PRAS analysis sees as far as the ability to share resources between regions, but also enforce some of the kind of real world suboptimalities or friction that uh, often exist in the real world around different, uh, different jurisdictions or different system operators, not necessarily being perfectly co-optimized with all their neighbors. And in conditions where you are dispatching your system uh, in this kind of suboptimal way, what are the implications on that for resource adequacy? And uh, what might um, we be missing in our kind of optimistic best case scenario view of this kind of global power system dispatch? Um, and then additionally, we're also looking at trying to make Praz uh, available in a wider range of programming environments. So right now, Praz is implemented in the Julia programming language, and you need uh, to be using Julia and be writing Julia code in order to uh, use Praz. And, and, and uh, that's basically like the, the interface to the tool. Um, but we want to uh, improve the accessibility of that, provide uh, some more options around, for example, um, using Praz from Python, as well as providing just a generic C-based interface that would allow you to um, link into the core simulation engine of Praz from potentially a much wider range of different contexts or user interfaces. Okay, so uh, with that, I think we have some time left for questions. So more than happy to uh, field those. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. And thank you for everyone's questions. It seems like we have a few in the chat now. Um, so just a reminder to type any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and I'll be reading them aloud to our speaker um, to answer right now. Um, so let's start with um, when modeling RA for LA100, how did you approach West-wide interactions? Some RA studies will model the entire WEC when assessing an individual BA or utilities RA. Yeah, sure. Um, very true. Uh, in our case, LADWP really wanted to understand whether they would be able to stand alone so they, I mean, they're a little unique in that they have a relatively wide resource footprint. They're bringing in uh, resources from lots of different places across the Western interconnection. So we modeled those resources that they kind of had direct ownership over in, in those uh, resource adequacy studies and, and modeled, you know, transmission constraints and things, getting that back to the LA basin. Um, but we weren't modeling the rest of the system. So it was basically the LADWP kind of LA footprint plus those other resources. And the, the research question was really, is this enough? Like, even if we don't plan on leaning on neighbors from time to time, are we still able to be resource adequate on our own? That was the, the stated goal. Um, so that's how we, we modeled uh, that system. Thank you. And I see someone has their hand up. Just a quick reminder, type that question in, in the Q&A box um, because your mic will be disabled. Um, all right, next question. Can you speak a bit more on how random outages are modeled? For example, independent MC draws. Uh, do you consider mean time to repair? Uh, can you model weather dependent force outage rates? Yeah, uh, yeah. So we, we do uh, consider mean time to failure and mean time to repair. It is uh, kind of your traditional uh, Markov process approach to generating those outages. So at any given point in time, you're in either a uh, forced offline or available state, and then you have some pro transition probability of moving either into the other state or staying in the same state. And those transition probabilities are a function of time. Um, so if like if we go back to Sinnott's work, that's exactly what he's doing there. He basically has these uh, transition probabilities, which are functions of the temperature that 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 particular plant is experiencing. And then based on that temperature, there's a particular 
probability that the system or that the generator goes on outage or doesn't or comes back online. And those those probabilities are all dynamically changing as a function of external weather patterns, um, which is what allows him to capture these uh, types of weather driven risks. Um, and Praz kind of has built in support from that. Uh, it, it, uh, directly models those heterogeneous Markov processes and those time variant transition probabilities. Thanks, Gord. All right, next question. Uh, can the PRAS outputs be shown in joules uh, versus megawatts and megawatt hours? Uh, we uh, basically define, when you define a PRAS system, you define all your units that you want to work in. Um, and those units are uh, basically you have the option of different sizes of megawatts and different sizes of megawatt hours. So, you know, if you want to do kilowatts, you can or megawatts, megawatt hours, gigawatts, gigawatt hours, um, whatever you like. Uh, we don't have an option for joules. Uh, I mean, it'd be a pretty straightforward conversion if you uh, wanted to report things in joules instead. Um, you just, you know, apply that scaling factor to your megawatt hour results, but that's not something we have out of the box, no. All right. Next question. Does the feedback with reads stop at IDing stress periods or also provide information about extra margin or shortfalls? Yeah, that's, so that's a great question. Um, at the moment, the, the reserve margin requirement is fixed. I believe... I don't want to misspeak here, but I believe it's basically based on the kind of classical NERC planning reserve margin uh, values for the different regions. Uh, we are looking at changing that, though. Um, so um, we have some other work going on that's pretty interesting that basically rather than defining a, re a static reserve margin for a particular region uh, and point in time, you would actually allow the model to optimize that subject to an overall probabilistic adequacy constraint. Um, and so some of my colleagues uh, on the Reeds team, uh, Brian Sergi and Arlan Bose Avram, are uh, actually working on implementing those methods in Reeds at the moment. Um, so as, as of right now, it's just based on a static reserve margin, um, but that may be changing in the future to something a bit more sophisticated. Thanks, Gord. Um, all right. Can you suggest in any India specific modeling uh, that can be done through PRAS? Uh, India, like the country India. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, there has been India specific modeling done in PRAS certainly uh, that I'm aware of. I was actually there doing a training workshop uh, about a year ago. Um, so I know that uh, certain parts uh, of uh, the grid India uh, dispatch centers are using uh, PRAS to do resource adequacy studies. Um, but as far as context specific, you know, applications of the tool, it's really uh, the tool capabilities are the same regardless of, of which system you're applying it on. So the, the model is, is not coupled to any particular geography or power system. As long as you can parameterize uh, the inputs that you need for the particular system you're looking to study, you can use all the features that I've talked about today um, for, for any particular power system. All right. Next question is, can you expand on your sampling method? Is the approach pure Monte Carlo across many dimensions, or do you also employ variance reduction approaches, for example, stratified samples, LHC, Sobel? Yep, good question. Um, we've definitely looked at some of those alternate or uh, yeah, variance reduction techniques. Uh, typically, though, what we find is the complexity associated with those isn't really worth it relative to um, the, you know, just kind of brute forcing more samples when you need it. Um, I mentioned, you know, 100,000 samples that we do in the past. Honestly, for a lot of these systems, it, the, the model runs so fast that that it's, you know, you can do that and it's not a huge, you know, a huge burden to do. Um, and uh, in some cases, honestly, that's overkill. Really, in the past, we've looked at 100,000 samples when we've been interested in capacity accreditation, especially because you kind of want the error bars on your estimates to be really tight so you can compare different uh, systems, reliability levels. Um, but for cases where you're purely looking at, you know, is the system resource adequate or not? I mean, you can reduce that by 
order multiple orders of magnitude. I mean, like a thousand samples is probably a very healthy sample size. Um, and you know, running a thousand samples in Pras, even on very large systems, is not a huge a huge undertaking to do. Um, and so, as a result, the kind of complexity associated with different variance reduction techniques that you could apply uh, traditionally haven't been worth it for us for the basic the extra computational and software maintenance burden that that would incur. So right now, yeah, to I guess to directly answer the original question, we're you know pure Monte Carlo kind of uh, just the the raw underlying distribution we sample from that. We're not doing anything to um, try and be smart about sampling from different parts of that distribution. All right, the next one is, do you have a plan to model wind and solar outage probabilistically? Uh, so the capability is in the tool. Um, if you want to, you can model wind and solar outages just like you would um, uh, thermal outages. And those uh, those parameters can be time varying as well, just like the thermal parameters can be. Um, so if you wanted to uh, model those types of things and you had good data for that, uh, you, you certainly could do that. There wouldn't be any uh, reason you couldn't set up the model to do that. Generally, though, I think we often are limited by data uh, as far as the ability to model that well. Um, that may change as things like NERC GADs uh, are collecting more and more information on um, like wind outages, for example. But as of right now, uh, that's not something that we actively use in our own analyses, although the capability is there if one day we wanted to start using it or someone wanted to use it um, and had the data to back up those assumptions. All right. And this next one, I think this attendee asked it before we got to this part of your presentation, but maybe you can expand on it. Um, so how does PRAS connect with other NREL tools? For example, I've heard that it'll link up with Sienna. Um, is that just for the purpose of taking in the network information, um, but PRAS is a standalone kit, toolkit? Yeah, um, so uh, it goes both ways with Sienna. So yes, loading in a, a power system representation from Sienna is something we do quite often and that that's pretty well integrated. Um, but we can also go the other way. So based on, we can't generate a Sienna system from a PRAS system because a PRAS system is simpler and has less information than you would need to do a full production cost model run. But what we can do is if you've already loaded in a Sienna system to PRAS, we can run that in PRAS, generate uh, probabilistic scenarios on the PRAS side and test those if desired, but then also feed those probabilistic scenarios back to Sienna. Uh, and basically simulate the exact same outage scenarios and grid conditions that Praz saw in the full Sienna simulation, which is, is basically exactly what this paper did. It basically generated a thousand different probabilistic scenarios on the Praz side, assess the reliability of the system on that Praz side, and then played out those exact same probabilistic scenarios on the Sienna side and looked at what the implications were, how less reliable the system was because of the additional constraints and detail that Sienna saw that Praz wouldn't have seen. Um, so we have that, that two-way um, interconnection based on that. And actually, um, that's something else that we're working on improving this year is basically providing a more seamless way to run the Praz engine directly inside the Sienna environment. So if you have a, Sienna, a power system uh, defined in Sienna, just like you would set up a production cost model run in Sienna, you could set up a PRAS model run and kick that off all from the Sienna programming environment and without needing to treat PRAS as a totally separate standalone tool that you're importing data into and out of. Awesome. Thanks, Gord. And it looks like we've made it through the questions. So um, if you have any last minute ones, you can type them in there. We have a few minutes left. Um, but while we're waiting, I will drop in the chat um, a couple links to register for future Powered by webinars, um, and you can also subscribe to our NREL Energy Analysis email list to receive updates. Um, and our next webinar in this series will be presented by NREL's Jared Wright, um, and it will focus on transmission planning. Uh, we'll talk about the NREL tools and studies that are helping stakeholders understand future transmission needs uh, to ensure clean energy goals can be met uh, at a reasonable cost to consumers. And that webinar will take place on Tuesday, October 
8th, um, same time, 10 a.m. Mountain, 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, and you can register through that Powered By webpage, um, which I just dropped a link to in the chat. Um, and I am not seeing any more questions. So with that, um, we'll close out a few minutes early. Um, so thank you so much for everyone uh, who joined. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.